This evening, we have the pleasure of welcoming Gastropod for their third live event. Hosted by Cynthia Graber and Nicola Twilley, Gastropod is the award-winning podcast that explores the secret history and science behind the food we eat every day. Cynthia and Nikki issued their first episode in September 2014, and they've covered everything from whale poo ice cream to nut nappers, whatever. <laughs> and the awards have rolled in. The International Association of Culinary Professionals gave them Best Culinary Audio Series, and the Radio Television Digital News Association awarded them the Regional Murrow Award for Best Online Documentary. Plus, Gastrobot has been included on multiple best of lists, including Wired Magazine's 11 Best Scripted Podcasts. So, pretty impressive. Tonight's three-course feast for the eyes and ears includes a pre-Valentine's dip into aphrodisiacs, interactive tastings, and a conversation with the chef owner of two of Boston's beloved restaurants. It is always fun and a privilege for us to present a live gastropod show here at the Museum of Science. Please join me in welcoming Cynthia Graber, Nicola Twilley, and their special guests. Hello, Boston. Spoken like the rock star you are, Cynthia. Well, this is my hometown. I do occasionally get recognized at the gym. And that, ladies and gentlemen, step away. That, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, is when you know you've made it. Now, I am not from here, but I am delighted to be back, as Lisa said, at the Museum of Science for our third annual live show. <laughs> this is becoming a tradition. How many of you have seen us live before? Yay, good to see you again. Pat yourselves on the back for being ahead of the curve. And if it's your first time, we're delighted to meet you. This is, as we've hinted, this is a live <laughs> performance of Gastropod, the podcast that looks at food through the lens of science and history. I'm Cynthia Graber. And I'm Nicola Twilley. And tonight, we are taking you through a three-course tasting menu involving pheromones, miracle berries, and spaghetti. Yum! <laughs> Sounds like a perfectly balanced meal. <laughs> so tonight, two lucky couples in the audience are gonna get to join us on stage and try out some supposed aphrodisiacs and tell us if they feel a tingle. <laughs> and then we'll be joined by an expert to reveal the truth. Can certain people make us mad with passion just because of how they smell? Then you will all get the chance to hack your own taste buds and make slices of raw lemon taste like candy. Plus, of course, we'll have the science behind that trick. And finally, you all get to play a game we created just for tonight. Match the pasta shape with the pasta sauce. And we'll be joined by one of Boston's top chefs to help us understand the science and history behind one of Italy's most favorite foods. At the end of the evening, both of our guests will come back up on stage and join us, and we will open it up for questions. So save up any questions you have as we're going along. You can ask whatever you want at the end. So, hey, Cynthia, guess what? Um, did you suddenly realize that you have somewhere else you're supposed to be? MBD, you can run the show without me, right? Uh, yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> no, I was going to say, hey, Cynthia, guess what? It's nearly time for my favorite holiday in all the world. <laughs> right, I tried to forget about that one. It's my holiday, favorite holiday, too. <laughs> Not really. We are true romantics. But, you know, even the worst holiday is better with food. So we are starting tonight's show with some news you can use. What foods will get you in the mood for Valentine's Day? Well, really, any day of the week. That's right, we are starting with the history and science of aphrodisiacs. So, Cynthia, this is something you have some personal experience with. Not to get all TMI, because I do know your mom is in the audience, <laughs> but share. Yeah. Hi, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> a couple years ago, my partner Tim and I were on vacation in Belize. We went snorkeling, and it was mind-blowing. <laughs> 
As we were snorkeling, our snorkeling guide went free diving for a conch, and uh, he brought up one of the big shells into the boat, and he took out the meat, and he pulled out this long, thin, gelatinous, kind of see-through bit, and he said, you want to eat it? And I, of course, said, sure. <laughs> And I kept saying, I wonder what part of the animal this is. And I somehow missed him saying something about how it was like Viagra. So I took a bite. My partner, Tim, took a bite. This random woman who was snorkeling with us, she took a bite. And again, I said, I wonder what part of the animal this is. Without missing a beat, at the exact same time, Tim and the guide said, the good part. <laughs> so I am not going to ask what happened next. But for those of you raised in Catholic school, the good part, that's the penis. And the idea is that eating it will lead to fun times in the bedroom. We didn't rip each other's clothes <laughs> off or anything. But this idea was and is really widespread, that you should eat genitalia to make your own genitalia more potent. People have eaten stag penises and bull penises, penises from all sorts of animals, testicles from all sorts of animals, too. It's a kind of sympathetic magic. The idea is that you can somehow absorb the strength and vigor of others by eating them. But we are a science show as well as a history show, and I should point out there is no science to this sympathetic magic. In fact, we are so super scientific that we are going to do a live experiment on stage here tonight with you all. But we need a couple of volunteers. So raise your hand if... <laughs> wait, 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 you gotta wait to hear. Wait, wait, I know you're all really excited. This you is may great. not be qualified. If you're in a couple here with your partner and you are both omnivores or at least pescatarians without food allergies. I have to say, uh, Ooh. yeah, there's a lot Lots of, of eager a lot guinea of pigs. Um, how about uh, you two up here? Come on up. Hello. Hello. What are your names? I'm Ari. I'm Allie. Hi. All right, we, hi Ari and Ali, we have a couple of foods with us tonight that have a long history as being used as aphrodisiacs, and we figured, why not feed them to you and see what happens? <laughs> not feed them to you in a sexy way. Or find out in an immediate way. <laughs> so, first up, you will find on the plate in front of you two extremely sexy spears of out-of-season asparagus. <laughs> So go ahead, take a piece of asparagus, take a couple bites, feel how you're feeling, you can finish it up, okay, think about that. And now, now once you're done, I'll let you swallow, it's okay. Once you're done, <laughs> take a couple slices of smoking hot pears. Mm -hmm. And while you guys are feeling your feelings, let's explain the hypothesis behind our super scientific experiments. So, in case your mind isn't in the gutter, asparagus and pears are supposed to look like penises and vaginas. Or maybe in the case of pears, curvy breasts? You can see whatever you want in there, Cynthia. But there is a certain kind of logic to this, at least if you believe, as the early Europeans who were using asparagus and pear as aphrodisiacs did, that God created the world for mankind. So the theory goes, he made all this stuff for us to use, why would he not label it according to its rightful uses? <laughs> and so, if he made an asparagus spear look like a penis, he's trying to tell you, it's good for your penis. So there were a lot of fruits and vegetables that fit into these categories, <laughs> things that looked like either male or female genitalia or body parts. And it wasn't just the Europeans who thought that if it looked like a thing, it should be good for your thing. Um, the, the Chinese thought so too. It's one of the reasons that bulbous ginseng was considered an aphrodisiac. So I, I want to check in on our guinea pigs here. <laughs> How are you guys feeling? Good. Pretty hot? <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, wait, we might amp that up a little bit. Um, so don't take it yet, but next you are going to get to eat an oyster. I hope you both are oyster eaters. This is good. Okay, great. So um, oysters are also supposed to look like a body part, a female one, if it's not totally obvious. And that brininess is also supposed to be, you know, sort of like women. And the 
slipperiness. And uh, <laughs> oysters, <laughs> oysters have an influential poster boy in the legendary lover Casanova. Reportedly had 50 oysters a day for breakfast. Famously said oysters are like women swimming in their own juices. So there you go. Here you go, each of you. <laughs> Slurp those oysters. <laughs> Can you just tilt it and yeah, yeah. You just yeah. Shoot. Got it? Uh -huh. You all good? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. I'm a huge oyster fan. Um, so the reason oysters are supposed to maybe actually work as aphrodisiacs, <laughs> <laughs> I should have had napkins up here, sorry about that, is, is, that, is that they have a lot of zinc. And zinc is apparently really important for the growth of sperm. So, how are you both feeling? <laughs> <laughs> this might just be the power of suggestion. We ran this theory by a couple of scientists and they said, yes, zinc is necessary for baby sperm, but unfortunately there is actually no connection between taking zinc and setting things on fire in the bedroom. Sorry. Okay, thank you both very much. You can go. <laughs> Great, take some work. Have a seat or go somewhere more private if you need to. So now we need another couple. Lights come on, please. You guys had your hands up first even before. Um, so I think, I think we're okay. I need to make sure for this. So first of all, no allergies, particularly no nut allergies, right? Okay. All good, come on down. And you are definitely over, t it's hard for me to tell from here, you're definitely over 21. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and your guys' names are? Victoria. Gabriel. Gabriel. Victoria and Gabriel, you are tonight's lucky winners because our next aphrodisiac is chocolate. <laughs> Help yourselves, enjoy that. We are going to check in with you in a minute. But so chocolate has a lot of things going for it as an aphrodisiac. One, it's actually delicious, and then <laughs> Two, we associate it with Valentine's Day. But this association between chocolate and romance and sex goes way back, back to pre-Columbian times. Cacao was considered an important energy food in what's now Mexico and Central America, and energy in all sorts of realms. The Aztec ruler Montezuma drank a legendary 50 cups of cocoa a day. He apparently drank chocolate before visiting his harem. <laughs> Chocolate made its way across the Atlantic in the 1500s. The conquistadors saw how it was being used in the New World, brought it back to Europe. One of the earliest commercial chocolate makers, an Englishman with a familiar sounding name of Cadbury, he picked up on this Montezuma Association and he started selling his chocolates in a heart-shaped box de decorated with bows and cupids and flowers and all that stuff. And it caught on. Chocolate became the gift to give your sweetheart, particularly on the newly commercialized holiday of St. Valentine. But it's, also, but it's also that chocolate was rare and expensive, and expensive things have always been considered aphrodisiacs, like potatoes. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> You're lucky. It's true. At one point, potatoes from the New World were really exotic and expensive in Europe, and potatoes were considered aphrodisiacs. So, how are you feeling after the chocolate? Pretty good. Great. <laughs> nice. Awesome. <laughs> but uh, I hate to bust your bubble, but actually the published literature shows that there is no difference in libido between chocolate users and non-chocolate users. We spoke to a couple of scientists, uh, Elizabeth West and Michael Crickman. They had reviewed the entire literature on aphrodisiacs, and they said there is, a, there is a chemical in chocolate that is a stimulant, but in none of the published studies were the effects clinically or statistically significant. But chocolate's still delicious, so whatever. Okay, so finish up the chocolate. Or not. I know, I know. You can hold on, <laughs> hold on to it for later, because okay. yeah. we have some more food for you. Here, each of you have a cherry tomato. I know, it's very exciting. <laughs> Here you go, cherry tomato. <laughs> so tomatoes are kind of like potatoes. So they're food from the New World that at one point was really rare and exotic in Europe, and tomatoes, like potatoes, were considered aphrodisiacs. Which is partly because of a mistake. 
the tomato got lost in translation. What happened was the Moors took the tomato from Spain to Morocco, and from there it went to Italy, and the Italians called it pomme de mori, which means apple of the Moors, and the French misheard that as pomme d'amour, which translates as love apple. Uh, the entire thing is like a giant game of Chinese whispers, so I don't know what Chinese whispers are, but I'm guessing you're saying it's something like playing telephone. Tomato, tomato, Cynthia. So how are you both feeling after those tomatoes? Lovely. Okay. <laughs> nice. Perhaps not surprising that it hasn't got you completely going, given that it was based on a mistake. But we do have more for you to try. This next aphrodisiac, if I'm being completely honest, is an unusual taste sensation. Um, but it does come from no less a source than everybody's favorite sex guru, the ancient Roman natural philosopher, Pliny. So Pliny wanted you to crush garlic and coriander in white wine and let them steep for a while. He called it an infallible <laughs> sexual <laughs> stimulant. <laughs> so here you guys go. <laughs> Drink up. You may want to only have a little sip, it's okay. But you should really be happy we didn't choose any of Pliny's other suggestions. He wanted men and women both to rub nettles on their genitalia. <laughs> Stinging nettles. Not something that I would suggest. What can I say? Some people like a little uh, pain. The other category of ancient aphrodisiac that we decided not to try live on stage was windy foods. Windy meaning um, things like artichokes and legumes, foods that make you fart. The <laughs> there was an ancient medical belief that an erection was actually just trapped wind or pressure. <laughs> so the theory went, if you gave your partner flatulent foods, you would essentially be sure to give them a hard on. So, now I have had Pliny's concoction. I am guessing that what you're feeling is a little more grossed out than turned on. Is that true? Yeah. A little bit warm. Yeah. It's a start. Okay, so maybe, a start. Yeah, maybe that's, that's something. But we did want to leave you both with something a little more delicious. So this next recipe comes from an ancient Arabic text called The Perfumed Garden of Sensual Delight. And this one is targeted particularly at males. It comes from a chapter titled Prescriptions for Increasing the Dimensions of Small Members and for Making Them Splendid. <laughs> now, we are not saying anything about the dimensions of your member, obviously, but it can't hurt, can it? Okay, so, so not, don't take it just yet, but you are each going to... Well, you can hold on to it, just don't eat it yet. Th these little balls here, you can each take one. Okay? So these are, yeah, not, yeah, much tastier, I promise. So these have crushed almonds and pine nuts and honey. Now, in theory, you're supposed to feed them to each other for three nights in a row. We are a one night show, but we're gonna give it a try anyway. So here, feed them to each other. <laughs> How are you feeling? You're still thinking about it. <laughs> Their mouths they're are really full. <laughs> Good. Yeah, they're pretty tasty. Um, honey is another of those things with a long association with sex and romance. Think honeymoon, you're my honey. Not actually you, Cynthia. Um, but that has probably more to do with the fermented honey drink, mead, which like all alcohol does advance the course of true love until it doesn't. <laughs> So while there's no science to support honey in general as an aphrodisiac, there is this kind of weird honey from Turkey called mad honey. It is used as an aphrodisiac and there does seem to be some science behind it. So it has a neurotoxin in it that bees gather from rhododendrons in the area. Now we tell you. Anna, <laughs> don't worry, we did not spike those, you're, you're safe. Because at low levels, it makes you a little lightheaded and it slows down your heart rate, and somehow that all translates to a feeling of sexual arousal. But at high doses, it's a hallucinogen, and it can give you a heart attack. So <laughs> the, the scientists we spoke to, Elizabeth and Michael, they said there have been cases where you know couples have taken this mad honey together, thinking they were going to have fun, and then they both died. Don't try this at home. <laughs> Thank you both very much. You have been <laughs> great sports.
So at this point, you might be thinking, do any of these aphrodisiacs actually work, or is it all just mistranslations and mistaken medical beliefs? So the scientists we spoke with, Elizabeth and Michael, they looked at any and all research on any and all aphrodisiacs, and they found some slight evidence for two substances. The first one is ginseng. It's supposed to be good for athletic and sexual energy, and they think it works by relaxing the smooth muscles, and they think that could increase blood flow to the penis and vaginal walls, but they really do not have enough evidence to recommend that as an aphrodisiac. And the other one <clears throat> is a tuber from South America called maca. Now this was hugely important to the Incas. They relied on it for energy on their long trips. It does seem to have some small impact on erectile dysfunction, but the scientists say they have no idea how it works, and so the jury is still out on that one. Basically, we need a lot more research in this area. Those experiments that were done on ginseng and maca, they were done on animals, mostly. Scientists, get on this. So. We are striking out, Cynthia. Maybe there is not a food that can make people rip each other's clothes off. But what about a scent? You might have heard of pheromones. These are chemicals that many animals release that communicate information to other animals, and one of those messages is, I am ready to get laid. As a competent user of Google, I am able to tell you that it, you can actually purchase pheromones online, and for a very reasonable price, you can douse yourself in a scent that will subconsciously alert all and sundry that you are looking to get jiggy. So this sounded too good to be <laughs> true. So we decided to invite somebody who actually knows something about pheromones. Catherine Dulac, please come up and join us. Catherine is professor of molecular and cellular biology at Harvard University, and she studies pheromones for real in the lab. So Catherine, we know that pheromones communicate information, but what exactly are they communicating? So animals communicate through pheromones. It gives them information about the sex of other animals of their own species, their kinship, uh, whether they are juvenile or adult, whether they can mate or not mate. So they are absolutely essential for quite a number of animal species. All right, let's talk about mouse sex. <laughs> when, when a mouse smells those sexy pheromones, what is happening in their brain and how did you figure that out? So uh, the way we figure this out is uh, we made m uh, mouse mutants that cannot detect pheromones. And then we tried to see how their behavior was changed. And the results were extraordinarily surprising. When we took a male, for example, that could not detect pheromones, they were able to mate perfectly fine. But then there was something different, which is when we put these males together with a male and a female, they were mating with both the male <laughs> and the female. <laughs> so the pheromones were not essential to trigger mating, but it enabled the male to discriminate between males and females. Without pheromones, the male is just mating with any mouse around. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so these are male mice. Yes. But what about female mice. I mean, you, so the neuron, I know from talking to you, the neuron is something that's in their nose, communicates yes. with their brain. So there so is a very specific set of neurons in the nose of the mice or, or rodents or many animals, and they exist indeed in males and in females. And so, yeah, you know, we were doing this experiment in males and each time I was giving a talk, a woman would raise her hand and say, <laughs> so what about females? And it took us a long time to figure out because very few people look at the uh, sex in females. You know, maybe scientists are mainly males and they're not that interested in females. Anyway, we found a very good <laughs> test uh, for females. And what we found was quite extraordinary, which is these females that could not detect pheromones, now they behaved like males, which is they were trying to copulate with males and females, exactly like a male would do. They were even emitting courtship courtship song that <laughs> usually only a male does. So what we gather from this is that these pheromones are essential both in males and females to identify the sex of the other mice as well as to determine their own sexual behavior.
But what does this mean that the females were acting like males? What does this tell us about the brain? Yeah, it, it, it tells us something very important about the brain. It tells us that the ancient dogma that there is a male brain and a female brain that are very different from each other, that's probably not true. There is one brain, and then there are ways to regulate the behavior towards a male type behavior or female type behavior. So I think it shows us that the brain is way more complicated than what we initially thought. I love it. It's all the same brain underneath. But this is mice. Uh, yes. What about humans? Well, so pheromones in humans, it's total BS. <laughs> But you have to know the story because it's quite interesting. So <laughs> first, all the genes that the mice are using to detect pheromones, none of them exist in humans, none of them. The structure, the olfactory structure that detects pheromones in mice does not exist in humans. In fact, it does not even exist in apes, right? So we cannot detect pheromones. However, you can buy pheromones on Amazon <laughs> for a little contribution. And so, what are these pheromones? <laughs> and, and here, this is interesting. And I hope to discourage you to buy some for the following reason. These pheromones are steroids. They are hormones. But they are hormones at extremely high doses, at doses that none of us would naturally encounter. And the idea is that the male pheromones are metabolites of testosterone, which is the male steroid hormone, and the female pheromones are estrogen derivatives, so derivatives of the female uh, steroid hormone, canonical female steroid hormones. And the way it works is the following. If it does work, uh, it, it's unlikely to be detected as pheromones because, as I mentioned, humans do not have the genes to detect them. But because these steroids are there at extremely high doses, when you put them on your skin, they are likely to go into your bloodstream. So basically, you're do dousing yourself with steroids, and that's not a good idea. In fact, the people who were commercializing this a long time ago, many of them has a lot of health issues, you know, because of these high doses of, of steroids. But then you might wonder, how, how, are these, how is this supposed to work? Well, pheromones, I didn't mention yet, but pheromones are supposed to be contact chemicals. So you need to touch the source of pheromone to do something. In other words, you know, the pheromones, uh, your, your partner will have access to these pheromones if they skin contact. But you might say, well, if they skin contact, you know, the job is done, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> and so here's the trick. When you buy pheromones, if you're a man and you buy the pheromones for men, what you're putting on yourself are actually the female pheromones, the oestrogen. And the idea is that it's going to act on you to make you ready and therefore attractive. And similarly, a woman would put on herself what the woman pheromone is, which is in fact testosterone derivatives, because it will be like the effect of a male on her and she will be ready. But don't do that. Okay. <laughs> so now we know. Do stick, not... Stick yeah. with the stinging nettles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's much better. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so we don't have these uh, olfactory neurons, pheromones don't work on us at all, but does, is there anything about scent that works? Like, what about the scent of our partners? Yes, yeah, so, you know, um, there are a lot of conscious feelings uh, that make us arouse uh, or ready, uh, put us in the mood. And it could be olfactory, it could be a wonderful perfume, um, it could be some uh, beautiful scenes or beautiful scent, some beautiful mo uh, food, you know, anything that basically puts you in the mood. And oh. that's the idea. So, where we started was aphrodisiacs and the idea that maybe there could be a food that could be a turn on. And so I'm thinking there could be a food that could be a turn on, right? If you have the association. Absolutely, absolutely. You should light uh, a nice candle and have <laughs> wonderful meal and enjoy it, and then you might be in the mood. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so, so much, much. Captain. Yeah, a round of applause. <laughs> so, Cynthia. We yes. have been the Valentine's Grinches yep. and busted everyone's favorite aphrodisiac myths. Mm -hmm. What else can we ruin for the audience? How about their sense of taste? All right. That's right. We are going to play some tricks on your tongues. 
But first, a quick refresher. Taste is one of the five senses, sight, sound, smell, touch, taste. It's a chemical sense, and it is not the same as flavor. Flavor is all the sensory information of a food combined. Taste is just a part of that. So probably the most important component of flavor is smell. As anyone who's ever had a cold nose, when your nose is stuffed up and you can't smell anything, your food tastes like cardboard. But taste is still important, and all the magic begins right here in your taste buds, on your tongue. So as you see behind me, yeah, just make it short. So <laughs> taste buds are these onion-like things. They are round balls of cells, and there are nerves that come out of the bottom like roots. And then there's a hole or a pore at the top, and there are fingers that come out, and these fingers are picking up chemical signals in liquid. So these little onion guys, they live right beneath the surface of your tongue. There are some scattered around the inside of your mouth, but really they're mostly concentrated on your tongue. And what happens is when you put a piece of food in your mouth, the chemicals in that food dissolve into your saliva, and then the little finger guys detect the chemicals, and they send a message to your brain saying, hey, this chemical is in your mouth. There are specific receptors on your taste bud that correspond with specific tastes, tastes that your things or chemicals that your brain translates as tastes. So there are five basic ones, sweet, salty, bitter, sour, umami. Scientists think that there might be other tastes that we can detect, maybe calcium. We might even be able to taste water, but those are still up for debate. But there are good evolutionary reasons why we can taste the things we can taste. If you think about the function of taste, it's an early warning system. Your mouth is the gateway for all these chemicals you're putting in your body. Take sweet. When your mouth senses something sweet, it sends a signal to your body that the food has a lot of calories. And this is fantastic from an evolutionary perspective. A sweet taste, actually, it, that advanced warning primes your digestive system. So sweet foods literally get your juices going before the food even hits your stomach. Sweet is the most obvious one, but scientists have theories for why we can taste all the things we can taste. So salt, that's something we need to survive. Our bodies can't make it. Umami, that signals protein, which our muscles need. Stuff like that. Something that's weird is that not all animals taste the same things we do. Cats, for instance, they don't taste sweet. Their diet is almost entirely protein, so they taste umami. And whales, dolphins, penguins, they've almost entirely lost their sense of taste, probably because they swallow their food whole. <laughs> Another thing that is freaky but does make evolutionary sense is, is that other species have taste buds in other places, not, not necessarily their mouths. So like, take fish. Fish are covered in taste buds. They have taste buds all over their body because they are picking up chemicals coming in all directions from the water. But what's even weirder is that we have taste receptors all over our bodies too. We have taste receptors in our lungs and in our guts. Men have bitter receptors in their testicles. Scientists are not sure why those are there. <laughs> testicles, so many mysteries. Let's get back to <laughs> tongues. <laughs> now, does this tongue map look familiar? Maybe your teacher taught it to you in school. If so, your teacher was wrong. That's right, we are not only gonna destroy your sense of taste tonight, we are going to rewrite everything you thought you knew about it. But it's kind of a strange story. It goes back to a man named, perhaps appropriately, Edwin G. Boring. Mr. Boring. <laughs> Mr. Boring was a big shot psychologist in the first half of the 20th century, and he decided he was going to write the definitive book on the history of the senses. And so he's researching his chapter on taste, and he comes across a paper written by a German scientist in the first years of the 20th century. And this German scientist reports that he has noticed very slight differences in how different parts of the tongue are sensitive to different tastes. So he had noticed the tip of the tongue seemed to be slightly more sensitive to sweet taste, the back of the tongue seemed to be slightly more tuned to bitter. So Edwin Boring took this information and he drew a map of the tongue, but he made it super exaggerated and demarcated. So according to Boring's map, you can only taste sweet on the tip of your tongue. If you put a candy at the back of your mouth, you won't be able to taste it. That's not what the German research said at all. But because Boring was so influential, this tongue map swept through popular culture and schools and everything, but it was wrong. Scientists know now that we have receptors for all of the tastes on all of our taste buds. It's true that one part of our tongue might be slightly, slightly sweeter than another, but we can taste everything everywhere. 
but we are not all tasting it exactly the same. And this is what we are about to try with all of you. So now you're going to need to reach into your bags. It's a little hard to find, but you're going to see a clear plastic. It's got a white strip inside. Take the white strip of paper out of the bag. Don't be afraid, but what you're going to need to do now is put this piece of paper on your tongue. It's not drugs, we promise. OK, everyone ready? In Here fact, we go. We will do it, too. OK, so I'm seeing some faces out there. And I'm guessing by some of those scrunched up faces like mine that some of you think it's totally disgusting. And to some of you, it just tastes like paper. And some of you are more like me, where you're like, sure, this paper's not, not so nice, but nothing to make a big fuss about, like Cynthia. OK, the lights can go down. Oops, I just dropped my paper. So. OK, OK, quiet. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to tell you what's on the paper. Don't you want to know? So, <laughs> So there is a chemical on the paper called PTC. It is, of course, a bitter chemical. It is one of the first tastes that scientists discovered there was a genetic component to it. Some people could taste it and some people couldn't. And there's a famous taste scientist at, down in Florida named Linda Bartoshock, and she discovered that there's actually a great variability in how sensitive people are to PTC. So if that piece of paper tasted truly and unbearably foul to you, you are likely what Linda calls a super taster. Now, do not get at all excited. You are not a superhero with superpowers. <laughs> what it actually means is super tasters taste things more intensely. Sweet is sweeter, bitter is more bitter. And if it tasted totally like paper to you, you're likely a non-taster. Sweet's not super sweet and bitter's not super bitter. But it's a, actually, it's a continuum, and most people are somewhere in the middle. So most people aren't at the extremes, but there are pros and cons to having to being at either extreme. So for example, super tasters, they might be more likely to avoid certain vegetables because of the bitter compounds in, the, in those vegetables taste too bitter to them. But those compounds we know are really good for us, so super tasters might have a less healthy diet than the rest of us. But super tasters are really sensitive to bitter compounds that could be poisonous. And this would be really useful if you're wandering around the savanna in search of something to eat. Bizarrely, there are population level patterns in who is a super taster and who is not. So men are less likely to be super tasters than women. Caucasians are less likely to be super tasters for reasons that scientists have yet to figure out. And um, so if that paper tasted really bitter to you, and if you know that you tend to avoid bitter foods, you can actually learn to like them. And maybe you should, because bitter foods actually have some really healthy compounds in them. And if you need some inspiration, there are a group of indigenous Peruvians who live really high in the Andes, and genetically they are all incredibly sensitive to bitter tastes. But there's this incredibly bitter potato that's a key part of their diet, and they all seem to like the potato. So you too can be like the Peruvians and hack your taste buds. It's actually very simple. All you have to do is add bitter foods into your diet slowly and reset your bitter taste perception. You can do the same trick, cut down on sugar, and you will become more sensitive to sweetness. Or if you want a quick hack, we have got the pill for you. In fact, you have the pill. It's in your bags. <laughs> it's a little red pill. You want to take it out, and what you want to do is you want to let it dissolve on your tongue. Do not crunch it. Do not swallow it. Just let it dissolve slowly to coat the surface of your tongue. OK, everyone's doing that? OK, you're, you're listening to Nikki. You just let it dissolve slowly and coat all your tongue. While you're doing that, I'm going to tell you what you're putting in your <laughs> mouth. I promise it's not poison. In case you want to know. Yeah. <laughs> So, this is an extract of a West African fruit called a miracle berry. It's a small red fruit. It looks something like a coffee berry, if you've ever seen one of those. 
And obviously, West Africans have been using it forever. But um, Europeans first described this. There was a European explorer in the 18th century, and he wrote that locals would pick these berries and chew on them before meals. So let's see what it was doing for them and what it's doing for you. Finish letting that dissolve. Just kind of swirl it around there to get your tongue fully coated. And then reach into your bag and take out that slice of raw lemon. Now, this is going to seem like a bad idea. Just do it. Suck on that lemon. <laughs> Promise. Try it. Try it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Everyone ready? Come on. I know, right? It's unbelievable. Talk about turning lemons into lemonade. I know. OK, so I know that you could suck on that lemon all day. I've done this. I wanted nothing more than to just sit around and eat lemons. But finish it up. Save, save a little bit for later. Now what you need to do is take out the strawberries and take a few bites of the strawberry. Get that in there. Try it. Feel your feelings. This one was personally very saddening and disappointing to me. I thought, I, like, to me, how could a strawberry taste so sickly sweet that it's kind of disgusting? But such is the power of the miracle berry. Scientists aren't sure exactly how the miracle berry works. They have some theories, and here's one of them. They think that it actually changes the shape of the taste receptor for sweet on your tongue so that other tastes like sour can lock into this newly deformed receptor. And so they register as sweet, not sour. The effects, those are going to last you anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour and a half, depending <laughs> on how much saliva you have and how strong your saliva is. So savor those lemons while you can. And see what the food and drinks taste like in the after party. So this is fun, and people actually have flavor hacking parties to experiment. But why might you actually want to hack your taste buds? There are a bunch of reasons. The uh, West Africans used it to sweeten their palm wine. Chemo patients, some chemo patients find that it makes their food taste better, gets rid of that metallic tang that can come with the chemo drugs. Diabetics can use it to have a sweet treat without an insulin surge. And scientists use it to study the mystery of taste. Which, as you all now know, is plenty mysterious. But it's time for us to move on to our final course. We save the carbo loading for the end. Pasta, perfect for dessert. <laughs> so pasta seems like one of those foods that's always been around. But like many foods, it actually did have to be invented. And unlike some legends you might have heard, Europeans did not get pasta from China. People in what's now Italy were eating pasta long before Mar Marco Polo traveled to China. To be perfectly on honest with you, inventing pasta is not rocket science. You mix flour and water, and then you boil the dough in water or broth. You don't have to be Einstein to figure that one out. And that's exactly what the early pastas would have been like. Tiny little balls like Israeli-style couscous or fregola, or larger balls of dough like gnocchi. This dish evolved multiple times all around the Mediterranean. And then people started rolling their dough into flat sheets. And you get the Roman poet Horace. He's writing that he enjoyed a nice dish of leeks, chickpeas, and lagane. Historians of pasta, it is a real job. They say that lagane is sort of like a proto-lasagna, like a flat sheet of pasta dough. The name lagane means rolling pin. The first pasta shape was described by an Arab geographer named Al Idrisi. He was writing about the island of Sicily, and he said the people there ate strings out of flour and water, like spaghetti. And spaghetti actually means little strings. From sheets to strings, and then Italian creativity is unleashed. People start wrapping those little strings, round sticks or reeds or later knitting needles, and then drying them to make twisty telephone wire shapes. This is all before telephones were invented. People had all sorts of ideas for their flour and water. And then later, some regions added eggs to the dough. But they would pinch the dough into little sculptures. And they named those sculptures after things they saw in their everyday lives. So daisies, and hats, and snails, and hailstones. 
and things they imagined they saw, like elves and angels. And then came the machines. Apparently, Leonardo da Vinci, everyone's favorite Renaissance Renaissance man, he invented a pasta-making machine. Unfortunately, it didn't work. But by the 1800s, pasta machines had evolved to the point where you could basically extrude dough through a die into any old crazy shape you wanted. And now people could make more shapes. They could make them and name them and pair them with sauces. But the even bigger impact of this industrial machinery is that more people could eat pasta. It became much cheaper to produce, and so pasta became hugely popular all over Italy. So we got all the shapes. The pasta is affordable. How should we go about eating it? I know just the person to ask. Michael Pagliarini, please come up and join us. I have to admit, I was really excited when we decided to do a segment of the show on pasta because it gave us an excuse to invite one of Boston's top pasta makers to come up here with us. Uh, Michael is the chef and owner of Julia and Benedetto in Cambridge. They're Michael. amazing. I am speaking directly from my stomach here because Cynthia and I had dinner at Julia on Monday and it was delicious. You are clearly a master of pasta. How did you learn? Well, I'm an enthusiast. We do work towards being a master, but you practice every day. At both Julia and Benedetto, we have 12-foot tables and all we do there during the day is make pasta and at night we set it for dinner and we cook hundreds of bowls during the week and I still go home at night or on Sunday and make pasta for <laughs> Pam and I. So it's, it's endless, it doesn't stop. So what people often want to know is how to pair pastas with sauces and we are going to have a quiz for you all to do tonight. Yes, we are going to put you on the spot and ask you to choose the right shape to go with a particular sauce. But before we get started with that, Michael, we wondered if you had any words of wisdom, overarching thoughts about how to think about shapes and sauces and pairings to give to the audience before they have to answer the hard questions. There are a lot of strong opinions when you talk to Italian cooks. <laughs> They're fiercely regional. <laughs> they have very well-developed ideas about what shapes go with what sauces. Um, so tradition is definitely a guide, but you want to th think about uh, flavor and texture as well. So it's a process, but it's a, it's a fun one to explore. So, All right. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. So you see behind us, you see a lovely ragu alla bolognese, or an American pronunciation, bolognese sauce. You are all going to have to vote to choose between spaghetti and egg tagliatelle. All right. Raise your hands if you want to serve the bolognese sauce with spaghetti. All right. And raise them if you're thinking it should be with the egg tagliatelle instead. Okay, so there's a few more people with egg tagliatelle, but we have some spaghetti folks kind of too. 50 50. Uh, yeah, maybe. Michael, what's your thought? Well, half of you are not allowed to travel to Emilia Romagna and to go to Bologna. So, the, because uh, tagliatelle is the traditional shape for ragu alla bolognese, and there's really no discussion about it. But why? <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> Any reason? Uh, the, there's a luxuriousness, a richness about this ragu and paired with a pasta that is made with egg yolks, um, there's a luxurious, silky, indulgent uh, texture that you get from that noodle, and it just works. I, I don't know, it's, that's the bottom line. Just, it works really well. Follow-up question, which shapes do you make with egg pasta as opposed to just plain flour and water, and why? Well, there's a lot of history and tradition. Um, I'm going to pick a region, Calabria, where they make all of their pastas with flour and water. There's a lot of reasons and speculations about why. One of the ideas is that they're very proud of the wheat that they have. Um, Durham semolina, you've probably all heard of it. A very famous wheat that a lot of pasta flours are made from. And when you make pasta with water only, it's a very pure expression of that wheat. So if you have a delicious wheat, you want to express it in a, in a very direct way. If you add eggs, you're adding fat, you're adding flavor, but you're also adding richness and nutrition. So it's a give and take. But traditions develop this way, and there's a lot of really wonderful, texturally satisfying, chewy pastas made from just water and flour. Awesome. All right. 
Okay, so the sauce now, it is a broccoli rub and sausage, and you are going to have to choose between cavatelli and bucatini. Tom, time to make the tough choices, ladies and gentlemen, and you can't sit this one out. You have to take a stand. Are you going to serve this sauce with cavatelli? Raise your hands. And are you going to serve it with bucatini? Hands up. There are definitely a lot more uh, cavatellis there. Michael, what do you think? Cavatelli. <laughs> Good job, guys. Yeah, cavatelli. There, there, I mentioned the, the chewiness, the thickness, the, the, that just satisfying quality that you get with a high protein uh, flour, wheat flour like semolina. And there's just something about the bite and, and, the, and the chewy satisfaction that is perfect against who drew the sausage, by the way? Is that oh, he's it? here, actually. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's just perfect against the fatty, uh, rich sausage and the bitter broccoli rabe. And I, I must not be a super taster because I crave these bitter foods. So There are advantages. There are advantages <laughs> to this. All right. Next sauce, cacio e pepe. This is Roman comfort food. It's such a simple sauce, two ingredients basically, pecorino and black pepper, and yet somehow it becomes this creamy deliciousness. But are you going to serve this creamy deliciousness with farfalle? Raise your hands. You don't want to get this one wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Don't, <laughs> butterflies, butterflies, anyone? Last call for butterflies, okay. And are you gonna serve it with tonarelli? Oh, we have such an educated audience. I know, Michael, what wow. do you think? <laughs> well, there's a few guys up there in trouble, big trouble with the, with the, with the farfalle. But it's, if you go to any trattoria in Rome, in Lazio, where they love cacio e pepe, it's tonarelli. So Why? you're all, most of you can travel to Rome safely. What's any the logic? There's something about uh, cacio e pepe is one of the most challenging sauces to make because you really have grated cheese and pasta water. There's no butter in cacio e pepe. So what you're trying to do is create an emulsification with the pasta water, the starches from the pasta, and these cheeses that can't be too old and they can't be too young. But there's something about the surface area and the length and that marriage, like the interaction between this long pasta and through constant motion to create this emulsification, it just works and it creates a beautiful creamy sauce that is nothing but a few very simple ingredients. It just doesn't work with farfalle. All right. Okay. So now you all see Alfredo sauce and I'm gonna see a show of hands. Who votes for angel hair pasta? Anyone? Who votes for fettuccine? Yeah. Okay, it's pretty unanimous <laughs> Everybody here. Everybody got that one. Angel hair pasta, why does it even exist? Michael, are they right? <laughs> is fettuccine right what you would serve with Alfredo? That is what tradition tells us, yes, fettuccine. And, and fettuccine Alfredo, it's worth mentioning, is not a cream sauce. It doesn't have any cream in it. What it, what it is, is a, a way to showcase a top quality parmigiano, and really high quality butter. Mm -hmm. It's luxurious, and we're back to this rich egg yolks and you know, top tier, dairy rich, egg rich uh, ingredients, and that's how this comes together. So should that fettuccine be fresh or dried? And how do you think about fresh versus dried in your whole pairing algorithm? I make fresh pasta you know, 10 hours a day, six <laughs> days a week, so I'm gonna go with fresh pasta. <laughs> um, and, one of the greatest things about making fresh pasta, especially today with the ingredients available to us, you can decide what type of flour you want to use. And you could pick a flour that is fresh, flavorful, nutritious, and really participates in the dish in a great way. It's like going to a good bakery. Um, and I, you just can't beat the texture of a freshly made pasta. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Okay, this is the final one, a gorgeous looking clam sauce, making me a little hungry. So, who votes for angel hair pasta? Anyone? <laughs> Don't listen to what Nikki said about not liking it, okay. Um, anyone voting for linguine? <laughs> okay. Michael, are they right with their linguine preference? You're right. That's, 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 you guys a, are good. It, it is, there's something, clams love this pasta. People in coastal, they, it, there's just something, There's 
it, it's such a natural pairing. And there's something about the simple, the, a, a linguine vongole, the sauce is very loose. It's a delicate sauce because it's just the juice from the clams as they cook, a little olive oil, splash of pasta water, maybe a squeeze of lemon and some parsley, but that's it. And sometimes when you eat a bowl of pasta, you want it to be a little slippery. You want it to twirl all the way through that experience of eating that bowl. And linguine does that just very well. So linguine is the one. So we actually have kind of a funny story about this one. We interviewed a woman named Maureen Fatt who lives in, it in Italy. And she yeah. translated the encyclopedia of pasta. So Maureen... Which is ridiculous, by the way, the number of shapes that she, she uh, categorized. It's, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> It's really crazy. So she was on an island off the coast of Italy, and she ordered pasta with a seafood sauce. Now, in general, as Michael just explained to you, linguine is the pasta for seafood sauce. But on this particular evening, the waiter comes up to Maureen and says, look, is it all right if I serve you this fresh fish sauce with linguine, or would you prefer spaghetti? And she's like, what? Everyone knows linguine is great with this fresh fish sauce. What could possibly be the problem? And he says, well, some people don't like linguine. And so again, she's like, what? You, you, like, ling you like spaghetti and you don't like linguine? Like, they are practically the same thing. So our point in telling you this story is you kind of can't win. <laughs> no matter what you do. Or you can't lose, depending on what you want to look at. I like that, it. So, actually. That's a nicer way to look at it. But yeah. I have to say, someone somewhere is probably going to tell you that you're pairing your pasta with your sauce all wrong. Some Italian person, probably. So, Michael, <laughs> you uh, have stressed the importance of tradition, but do you ever break it yourself at the restaurant? Yes, we do. Uh, <laughs> tradition is a very good guide. And sometimes we, uh, we think of ourselves as caretakers of some great traditions. And we like to understand the traditions completely and fully and to try to recreate them faithfully and make the discoveries for ourselves as a new generation of cooks who have decided that ragu alla bolognese is an important recipe and we want to keep it relevant and we want to make it you know, here and now with the ingredients we have. Sometimes we work backwards, and we'll come up with an idea for a dish, and maybe there is no traditional uh, you know, roadmap. So I'll give you one example, if I could. We had some buckwheat flour. Now, that's already an unusual flour for Italy. You, you, you find it in some northern regions in a pasta called pizzoccheri, which is paired with potato and cheese. But I was thinking, it was springtime, and I was thinking about sweet, light, aromatic flavors, and I was thinking more in terms of a buckwheat noodle, a soba noodle. And what we came up with was a vegetarian pasta that was made with buckwheat, and it had a sweet onion crema, and it had asparagus, and it had a beautiful sweet uh, white mushroom called Nebrodini Bianco. And there is no traditional Italian pasta for this, but it was, our, it was good ingredients, and it was us just practicing our craft and sharing some ideas. So yeah, we break rules and we make up new stuff too. I love it. Yeah. I love it. So <clears throat> are there any pastas that are difficult to make or to cook? Or particularly difficult to eat even? Yeah, all you have to do is look at someone's apron and you know if they <laughs> know how to cook the bucatini or they don't. Because bucatini, like there's this, any pasta, there's a point at which um, the pasta and the sauce cook together, and they go from being two separate entities to getting married together. And bucatini is a particularly unwieldy noodle. It wants to flop around. It kind of, it's, it's difficult to eat. It could like slap you in the face if you're not careful. <laughs> and um, you have to get it, the challenge of cooking it is spectacular because if you can tame it and get the bucatini to behave the way you want it to, it's a really satisfying uh, experience. So bucatini's hard, and so is a traditional pasta from the Veneto uh, called bigoli, which is a thick spaghetti, also unwieldy, and the timing is, is tricky, too, how long to cook it. Yeah. So why bother with bigoli? I, <laughs> you know, we're adventure seekers, I think, in <laughs> our restaurants, and I, I think, you know, enthusiasts, they, you're after 
um, extremes, whether it be the angel hair pasta or the beagle, which are probably at the two opposite ends of the spectrum. So maybe you would love the beagle since you are so <laughs> averse to the angel, angel hair pasta. So we need to find out. So I have had bigoli at his restaurant with anchovy sauce, and I can attest it is a little challenging to eat, but also really delicious. Um, but so, you know, we have all these different shapes that you're talking about, but most people don't have all of these different shapes in their kitchens. Is there any one shape that you think is really versatile that goes with a lot of different sauces? Yeah, I have a lot of ideas about what you should have in the cabinet at home. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look in my cabinet kid, at home. Don't look in the cabinet at home. I always come home. I, we make fresh pasta every day, but I, I, I love dried pasta as well. There's, there's nothing wrong with it. You need, you need a long pasta. I would recommend a medium thickness spaghetti. It's just versatile. Um, and you need a short pasta. Classic shapes like penne or fusilli. If you have a long and a short pasta, you could really make whatever you want. Uh, there. It's the good, it's my advice for that. Great. So um, I might have mentioned already there's a pasta shape I hate, angel <laughs> hair. Um, maybe I just had it with the wrong sauce, I don't know. But if I had to ban one pasta shape, it would be that. Michael, what would you 86 and why? Wow, I, I think when we invented pasta extruders, there was this sort of, you know, race to create the most ridiculous shapes you can with some of these you know, pastas that are shaped like radiators or wagon wheels or some of the more playful shapes. Um, I, I would probably eliminate most of those crazy, <laughs> cra cra like you don't need a pasta shape like a radiator. You really, you really don't. Um, okay. So that it gets a little too whimsical and playful at times. I, st I stick to the basic long, short, stuffed cavatelli mixed in. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Five. You can have a seat. And you should all definitely, yep, definitely check out his restaurants, Julia and Benedetto. They are both in Cambridge. They are both amazing. We are not quite done with pasta yet. Yeah, no. So having explored the science of pairing what shape with what sauce, although I think having heard Michael talk, it may be a little bit more of an art than a pure science. But we wanted to get into the history of some of the shapes themselves. So as we told you, when people started sculpting their dough into shapes, they named those shapes after things they saw in their everyday lives. But times changed, and so pasta shapes changed too. Turns out, you can pretty much tell the history of Italy through the dinner plate. So take mafaldine. These are long ribbons, about half inch wide, with wavy edges. They're supposed to look like the kind of ruffles a royal princess might wear. A royal princess such as Princess Mafalda of Savoy, part of the Italian royal family. This might explain one of their alternative names, Reginetti, for regal. So the, the story goes, when Princess Mafalda was born, the pasta makers invented this new shape in her honor. Although there is a suspicion that they actually just renamed an existing shape, Manfredini, uh, to take advantage of royal baby fever. <laughs> you can also tell a bit about Italy's colonial history through pasta. There's a shape called Tripolini for Tripoli. They're little bows that are meant to represent the Italian conquest of Libya. Or take Anelli. These are big uh, hoop earrings supposed to resemble the big hoop earrings worn by uh, Eritrean and Ethiopian women, and yes, Eritrea and Ethiopia were former Italian colonies. So colonialism, yes, but colonialism commemorated in pasta. Less controversially, or perhaps just differently controversially, uh, there are also pasta shapes that celebrate technology. So uh, the magic of the automobile actually inspired Michael's favorite shape, the radiatore. I'm, I'm going to put myself out there again and say, I actually think it's an undervalued shape. It's got a lot of surface area. <laughs> then there are flying saucers, disky volante. They were invented after World War II when UFOs were having a moment. And people are still inventing shapes today. So uh, Maureen told us about a company called Verini, which is creating these rigatoni-like shapes, except for they're all right angles, super geometric. They say they're good for pasta salad. So, 
There are hundreds of pasta shapes. People still inventing pasta shapes. It's endless. Endless and a little confusing <laughs> because people in one town in Italy will call a shape by one name and a couple towns over they have the same shape and they call it a totally different name. Or you have one region in Italy that loves a particular pasta shape and another region could not be bothered with it. Which this sounds very Italian, like pasta. But actually the latest innovation in pasta shapes comes from right here. Not literally right here like the museum, but up the street at MIT. But you are going to have to wait for our pasta shape <laughs> episode to hear all about that. <laughs> we gave you a sneak peek tonight, but the episode is coming out next week. And you will hear about an entirely new technology to invent new pasta shapes. But that is it for tonight, folks. We are going to have a Q&A, but first we have a few words of thanks we want to say. First, a huge, huge thanks to the Museum of Science for inviting us for the third year in a row. Lisa Monroe and James and Wetzel are, as always, amazing and have worked so hard to make this night a success. Thanks to you and the entire team. Thanks also to our special guests, Catherine Dulac of Harvard University and Michael Pagliarini of Giulia and Benedetto. I think you can all agree that they are super special guests indeed, and you should definitely check out more of Catherine's work and Michael's delicious pasta. And we also wanted to give a special thanks to our volunteer illustrators, Dave, Lauren, and Eric. They volunteered their time and talent to make this show at least 100% more beautiful than it would have been otherwise. And you will probably want to check out their work, so we put their contact details online. If you enjoyed tonight, we have good news. We're a podcast. We come out every two weeks. It's not live, of course. You have to bring your own snacks, but we are on demand. Find us at gastropod.com or wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe. If you listen in, you will not only get to hear our full Pasta Shape episode, you will also discover such things as how to find out if the olive oil on your counter is really extra virgin, and why medieval nuns were hooked on saffron. And finally, a huge thanks to all of you for making tonight so much fun. All right, Michael and Catherine, come on up. I'll move over a little bit. Yeah. <clears throat> So the way this works is that the museum staff are circulating with microphones, so all you guys have to do is put your hands in the air, and they will come to you. All right. So we have our first question back here to your right. Um, since there's such a uh, negative attitude, maybe, towards angel hair pasta. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I stand firm. I'm not disagreeing. Um, but I'm wondering, is there an appropriate sauce for it? Angel hair is often served in a broth, almost like the pasta will finish cooking or continue cooking as you're eating it. Um, I don't dislike it at all. I, I think it's, <laughs> it's challenging to work with, and it's very difficult to cook correctly, but in a, in a good, good, challenging way, and it has a great, delicate texture to it. I love angel pasta. Isn't that good? Oh, that one's not on for you. Next question to your left. I thought I was going to have to shout then. Um, so it's another pasta question. I actually can't eat cheese or tomato, which <gasps> leaves pasta sauces difficult. So any suggestions to actually what to eat with my pasta other than butter, which is getting boring? I'm so glad you asked because most people think that tomato and cheese are the only way to make a pasta sauce. And if you use a sandwich analogy, which I love to do, like people are comfortable making up a sandwich. If they have good bread, you just put whatever you want to eat on the sandwich. And pasta is really the same way. I mean, we're talking about wheat flour derived things here. Um, I would suggest um, having a few flavorful broths around. Here's a really easy one. If you get a can of chechi beans, or maybe you boil your own at home, either way. Um, those, that liquid from those chechi beans is really flavorful. And with some garlic and some olive oil, you could skip the cheese, 
but put the chechi beans in with your pasta and have this pasta y lenticchie or, pa or pasta chechi and uh, maybe a handful of spinach or if you're inclined to eat the bitter vegetables, some broccoli rabe, I think that's great. A mushroom broth is great too. A Chechi, little bit are of chicken those garbanzo? Ch uh, uh, chickpeas? Garbanzo, garbanzo, uh, chickpeas. Chickpeas. Okay, yeah. just making garbanzo sure. Garbanzo chickpeas, chickpeas. Just in case you guys don't know yeah. what chechi are. Yeah. Great, we have our next question here to your right. Um, actually, uh, this is about pasta again. Um, <laughs> um, is there a trick to making gnocchi? Um, I'm, I've made it a bunch of times and I've experimented and I've always been a little unsuccessful. It comes out kind of doughy or you, you taste a little bit too much of the flour. I don't know if there's a trick to making it. Yeah, are you talking about potato-based gnocchi? Uh, I've done potato, I've done you know more you know, wheat-based as well. Yeah, I, I think that the, the, the biggest challenge with potato-based gnocchis is that um, if the potatoes are wet or they, they haven't had a chance to steam or to dry, they, they, they need a, a good amount of um, flour to compensate for that wetness. Um, you have to choose the right potato too. And if you have a good classic fluffy baking potato, those are the ones that just work the best. Um, most pasta making is a little bit of repetition and my gnocchi recipe is the one that is the most fluid because I'll boil the potatoes, I'll rice them out onto the right onto the work surface and in a wide surface area I will scatter it with flour and just dimple it all over the place and use my fingertips to sort of gauge the amount of moisture and as soon as it overcomes the stickiness then I'll start to fold it on top of itself. I'll stream in a, a little bit of egg yolk and some olive oil and, and season with nutmeg and, and salt across the board. <laughs> Is this getting too complicated? <laughs> I hope um, you all ate dinner I first. I didn't eat dinner first. <laughs> <laughs> and then fold it over on itself using some bench scrapers, but yeah. We'll, practice. we'll talk after this. <laughs> Next question is also in the left section. Um, I have a question about egg-based versus water-based pastas. Yeah. I'm not sure if this is really a thing, if it's just a pattern. I've noticed that the egg-based pastas are usually rolled out fairly thin, but the water-based pastas you tend to have thicker, chewier shapes, that, like a raquette where you're shaping with the thumb. And you know, is that am I like misinterpreting? Is there any patterns there like that, or not really? <laughs> that no, are I there any water-based pastas rolled really thin? Well, I, I think your observations are correct and my experiences are mirror what you're saying. Um, I think you can achieve a thinner sheet of pasta, a more delicate sheet of pasta when you involve eggs and egg yolks. And I mentioned the, the fact that in, you know, when you add a fat, like an egg yolk, to your dough, you're adding tenderness, um, but you're also adding the strength that comes from the lecithin, which is an emulsifier and you're adding strength in the form of the proteins uh, in the egg white and you can just and you're using often using a refined flour traditionally paired with the yolk and you could achieve the desired thin sfolia those thin sheets the eggs just tend to perform better for thin shapes so yeah can a, i ask a short a answer yes <laughs> great is this about pasta it's about pasta. <laughs> <laughs> even our science <laughs> our pheromone scientist so What's the relationship between Italian pasta and Asian type pasta? Is that something completely different or is there something in common? I, I mean, when you think there are um, two great noodle based cultures, um, and I talked about the, the soba noodle idea that I had with the buckwheat, um, I, I think that, you know, oftentimes you see the Asian based traditions cooked and served in a broth and more of like a soup. Whereas the pasta, the, the Italian traditions, they, have, they, they call it pasta asciutta, meaning pasta that has been drained from the water that it is cooked in and then finished in a separate sauce. Um, so that's one major difference. Um, but you know, you can achieve a lot of variety of texture and bite and elasticity and tensile strength, varying your techniques and varying your flowers and the way they're milled and the way they're refined. So there's a, there's a, it's, a, it's a large uh, topic, but I think that you know, cooking pasta and serving it in a broth, in a soup, in a traditional 
way that you might find is, is one big difference, differentiator. Yeah. Great. We have our next question here in the back of the house. My question is about the Miracle Berry. Um, <laughs> so after a Miracle Berry party uh, where my friends and I had all eaten a lot of Greek yogurt and a lot of balsamic vinegar, we all got very <laughs> ill. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm curious, um, in, uh, is there something beyond sort of avoiding poisons? Are there uh, good reasons why we don't usually eat that much bitter or sour all at once? Um, and in general, in experimenting with miracle berries, what should one be wary of? So I can talk I mean, from I my think, I mean, I think one of the things to know about um, taste, as we said, is it is this early warning system. So it is priming your body, your digestive juices for what is coming next. And so if you're tricking it, that has consequences. You're telling your body to expect something sweet and actually something sour is coming down the hatch. And your body is not generally fond of these kinds of pranks. So. Right. <laughs> Too much sour? Ouch. Yeah. I should add also that um, Oh, yeah, we have toxins. an actual scientist. <laughs> 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 Many toxins taste bitter. So bitter is something that tells you that what you put in your mouth is bad. And usually you can't distinguish between different uh, bitters. Um, and, and the idea is that you just need to know it's bad and spit it out. You don't need to know, you know what is bad, but just that uh, it's out. So if you taste this uh, miracle berry too much and eat too much bitter substances, it's probably toxic for you. So be careful. <laughs> be careful. Next question down in front. Uh, I was wondering why humans don't have pheromones like as an evolution. Is there theories on why that is? Yeah, so this is a very interesting question, actually. Um, you can trace the loss of the system that detects pheromones, and it corresponds to a very interesting evolutionary event, and that is the duplication of the red and the green opsin genes in your oh. eyes. So that means that animals suddenly that had this gene duplication were able to distinguish color. And so instead of, for example, determining whether a fruit was ripe because it smelled ripe and had the, the smell of a fruit, now you could see it's red instead of green, therefore it's full of calories. And so you can see in primates, as uh, in, the, in the split of animals that have acquired color vision versus non-acquired color vision, the entire olfactory system, including more specifically the one that detects pheromones, is gone, and instead the visual system expands. And you can see this in, in the brain itself. So if you look at the brain of a mouse, about one third of the brain is dedicated to olfaction, or odorants and pheromones, etc. If you look at the brain of a human, uh, about one third is dedicated to visual input, to visual processing. So that's why we lost pheromones. We acquired something that enabled us to determine whether something was good or a female was ready um, from long distances because <laughs> olfaction, <laughs> olfaction is contact. You need to be close, but vision enabled you to, to determine this from far away. Which is why our pornography is visual rather than smell-based. <laughs> <laughs> Great, we have the next question over here to the right. Uh, Dr. Dulac, uh, I wanted to take this business about pheromones a little further. <laughs> Back when I was uh, 15 and very inexperienced, uh, we were, my <laughs> family going. of origin was at a pond on the Cape with some cousins, and a, a girl there attracted my attention. Just riveted me and I didn't get up the courage to talk to her there and after we got home I bicycled all over town looking for her, found her and uh, she, she was in front of the laundry and I sat down on the ground next to where she was sitting. She sat down right next to me and pretty soon I felt the way, uh, you know, if those experiments that uh, our speakers had uh, performed had really worked. I felt the way that, that they would have felt. 
I mean, it was like something incredible was enveloping me. <laughs> and, and the word pheromone was not a, in my vocabulary. This was before men had walked on the moon. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it just, I mean, I was being driven crazy by this. Uh, you know, and, and it wasn't from any association with anything previously. Uh, it just happened. But maybe this lady looked beautiful, so... Uh, <laughs> you know, my, my cousin Marilyn... Maybe she had a My cousin voice? Marilyn assured me that she was not beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe not to Marilyn. Yeah, well, no, you know, I, I, I mean, she wasn't bad, but, you know, I, I, it, it, was, it was definitely olfactorily based. Uh, and, and, you know... I don't think science is really equipped to explain, explain the teenage male brain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's a bridge too far. Oh, ye of little faith. <laughs> yeah, maybe you were so bubbling with testosterone. <laughs> with testosterone. You know, that was like sufficient a I mean, to make I, you I ready. I had my share of it, but uh, I, I, <laughs> no, it wasn't that. It was, it was something that was coming off of her. And, you know, and, and later, as I, I got into young adulthood, I came to realize that scent was actually very important to attraction. You know, it, it made a huge difference. <laughs> it is, but you see, pheromones are not consciously perceived. And we are very sensitive to scent, we are very sensitive to perfumes, etc. But this is conscious. And, you know, that makes the human brain quite different than uh, the brain of a mouse. <laughs> well, it was definitely, you know, it was definitely <laughs> scent. Uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll accept that definitely. Uh, but you know, it, it it was really powerful. So a good okay. experience. Anyway. Yeah. Hmm? Next question in the back to the left. Uh, <laughs> somewhat similar, it? actually, <laughs> but I. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. Sorry, sorry, but but shorter, and and and, 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 I'll, and I'll say it in this way. So. Do we then understand the, I guess, algorithm for human attraction to be basically hormone plus visual, maybe some scent in there, I'll give it to you, but equals attraction? Yeah, no, attraction is very complex. It's very multisensory. Um, so, you know, the pornography illusion that uh, we had is actually very real. You know, we, they are sensory stimulation that really trigger our arousal and pornography is exploiting this. So it's not only vision, it's vision and sounds. So both of them are very potent. As well as touch, as well as smell, as well as A also... A good bowl of pasta. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The human brain is also very special in its ability to function in itself without sensory stimulation. So there is also what's happening in your own brain. And you know your rumination about I don't know women or um, or that person. What you might be thinking about might happen yeah. with that person. Exactly. So a lot of things are happening inside too. I can't say we understand it. We are going to have our last question for now over here to your right. Uh, if you have more questions, please stick around for the reception. All four of our guests will be around to continue to talk and answer anything that you may have. I'm avoiding pasta and, and olfaction over there. Um, it was very interesting what you said about the evolutionary development of the migration from the olfaction to the visual. Have you done any corollary studies to see if people are missing those photoreceptors, do they have enhanced olfaction? So colorblind. I don't know. <laughs> but I assume that people who are colorblind or, or people who are missing one particular sensory modality usually expand uh, other sensory modalities. So it could be touch, it could be taste, it could be uh, many different things. So that's, you know, there's nothing in the brain that stays empty. If there's one part that doesn't receive stimuli because, let's say, you're colorblind, then other modality will take over. Which is curious if you could also undo evolutionary patterns and, and go backwards. 
Uh, I don't know about these, but I can tell you that there is a scientist who has tried to do the opposite, which is to make a mouse uh, be able to distinguish red from green and to see what was happening. And, well, the poor mouse was a bit confused. Let's say. <laughs> <laughs> so that is all we have time for tonight. Please come join us at the reception. Enjoy the food. See how it tastes to you. Enjoy the beverages. And uh, come say hi. We'd love to meet you. And a thank huge you, thanks again, yeah. Catherine and Michael. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Cynthia, Nikki, Catherine, Michael. Phenomenal, phenomenal fun night. Thank all of fun. you for braving <laughs> the elements, as I said. And please do come downstairs and join us for some libations and tasty... So Hopefully <laughs> tasty, depending <laughs> on your tasting cheese. <laughs> Good night. Thank you, and come back.